Good morning. My name is Stapleton Roy. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, Center for International Scholars, uh, International Center for Scholars. Um, before I welcome our Chinese guests, I'd like to say a brief word about the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, we were created by Congress uh, in, the eight, in the 1960s as a memorial to the only American president who had a PhD and was a scholar. Uh, we are a, the goal of the Woodrow Wilson Center is to engage in scholarly research with particular relevance to public policy issues. Uh, and we are a rarity in this city in that we have retained bipartisan support from Congress because we have o no ideological leanings one way or the other. Uh, we engage in scholarly research. For four years now, the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States and the counselor's office of the uh, PRC State Council uh, have been engaging in a series of symposia looking at comparative governance issues in China and the United States. Uh, we've covered a wide range, how economic policy is formulated, um, how national security affairs are coordinated, uh, how each country handles relations between the central government and the local governments, uh, how we deal with uh, risk management, both at the corporate level and at the national level how we deal with um, earthquakes, national disasters. Uh, we've covered a whole range of issues. This year we are focusing on innovation because innovation is really fundamentally important to, it's the driving force you could say in modern economies. And we will be looking not only at the state of innovation in China and the United States, but we will ha be, be considering how we train people to be more innovative, which really depends on the incentive structures that exist in countries. People who are non-creative in certain social contexts become highly creative in other social contexts because of the different incentives for thinking new ideas and trying to put them into implementation. And both China and the United States have demonstrated enormous capacities for innovation, but innovation also has to be translated into practical results. And so one of our topics today will be to look at how we commercialize the results of innovation. So we are very pleased uh, that we have our guests from the counselor's office of the um, PRC State Council, headed by Vice Chairman uh, Wang Wei Min. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Vice Chairman Wang if you would like to say a few opening <coughs> statements. Honorable guests, dear friends, Honorable Mr. Roy, it is my pleasure to be here in Washington, D.C. to be at the fourth symposium on U.S.-China Comparative Government Organization and Operation. On behalf of China's Council's Office of the State Council and our delegation, I would like to take it, this opportunity to express my gratitude to uh, Ambassador Roy and our friends. In the world of globalization, the relationship between our two countries is becoming uh, more independent. On uh, many major issues, global or regional, we have many common interests. The two nations have been enhancing our economic and trade cooperation, which is good for the economic recovery of the world and the stabilization of international finance. With more people-to-people -people exchange, it is 
good for our understanding and mutual trust. As we continue to enhance our political mutual trust, it is good for uh, breaking down the barriers between the two countries and the stabilization of the region as well as the world. Nowadays, our relationship has become one of the most important and most dynamic bilateral relations in the world. We are celebrating the fourth, uh, 40th anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China and the 40th anniversary of uh, the Shanghai Communique. At this memorable moment, we're here in D.C. to talk about scientific and uh, technological innovation with all of you here. I think this is very significant. This year in May, we held the third innovation dialogue in Beijing. In this mechanism, we gained a lot of progress and it was very highly uh, assessed by our two leaders and the society. At this important juncture, we are going to continue our dialogue with the Kissinger Institute on SNT innovation. I think this is very meaningful. The COSC is a governmental consulting agency directly under the State Council. We are responsible for doing research and providing suggestions to the government. This symposium is the fourth one we are holding with the Wilson Center. In the past three symposiums, we talked about risk management, we talked about organizational reform, as well as the relationship between the central government and local governments, and the prevention of corruption. We have made great uh, progress in improving our mutual understanding and mutual trust, and we've also gained a lot of consensus. On this very important foundation, we have also provided uh, many suggestions to our central government in China. I hope that as we deepen our cooperation, our work here can be a good complement to the exchange of our two governments and build a good platform for the exchange of our think tanks that play an important role to our relationship. Lastly, on behalf of the COSC and my delegation, I would like to again express my gratitude to the Kissinger Institute for your thoughtful arrangements. I would like to wish every success of this symposium. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wong. We will now turn to our first panel, uh, which will be chaired by uh, the Dr. Um, no, I'm chairing the first panel. Excuse me. <laughs> Marco, I was about to turn things over to you. That, that would be a significant violation of the program. Uh, our first panel, we will have presentations by Kent Hughes, who is the director of our program on America and the Global Economy. Uh, and the program on America and the Global Economy was a collaborator with the Kissinger Institute in uh, arranging this symposium. And then we will also have uh, former Vice Minister of Science and Technology, uh, Mr. Liu Yanhua, uh, make a presentation on the Chinese side, on science and technology um, uh, of China. Um, Kent, would you like to s sit up here or do you want to make your presentation from up there? I think that probably works. Okay. Work best. Let's see if we can. Luckily, we have technologically sophisticated people who can uh, make sure this works. Well, good morning, all. It's a great pleasure to see some of my old friends from the counselor's office. Welcome to uh, Washington. Again, I need to uh, apologize for my very limited Mandarin that really doesn't go beyond ni hao ma, shi shi ni, yi zai chen. So that's a sort of a brief conversation. <laughs> uh, you have the slide in front of you of the overview of what I'd like to cover in a very brief uh, few minutes. Uh, a look at the history of how the innovation system developed here. Uh, a brief word about the American culture 
which favors some kinds of innovation, uh, look at the state of the current innovation system, some of today's challenges, and a three-part look at the challenges that at least the United States faces in the future. we move this forward? That's my question. Ah. One of the things that is striking about the American Constitution, which compared to other constitutions is quite brief, is that it includes a specific provision which is targeted at innovation. Article 1, Section 8, the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful art by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This remains something that was, that is, that remains a key part of the American innovation system on which there continues to be a great debate, the question of intellectual property rights. In the midst of the Civil War, there was a major step toward what is today's innovation system with the establishment of the land-grant colleges in 1862. From the start, these were quite different from European uh, universities. There was an explicit practical orientation. You can hear echoes of that practical orientation still in universities such as Texas A&M where A&M stands for agriculture and mechanical. They are now really many of our, the state land-grant colleges, many of our tier one research universities. For many years, innovation was not the focus, however, of the federal government. During the 1920s, you begin to see the rise of real industrial laboratories. To be thematically correct today, I wore my Thomas Edison tie. Uh, Edison, as you know, was a major inventor, developed his own laboratory, and much of our innovation had that kind of character. You may have heard of Bell Laboratories, was uh, established, grew out of some other institutions established in the uh, 1920s and became a font of all kinds of innovations, some of which were really basic, some of which really lent themselves to application. The rise of global competition, particularly in the 1970s, created a challenge for these industrial laboratories. And gradually they shifted their orientation from basic research to applied research and increasingly to development. So they moved much closer to the market. This created what many people refer to as the valley of death, that chasm between the innovation that occurs in a laboratory and the actual practical application that can move it into the market. World War II was really a transformational experience for the United States and for much of the world. It was after World War II that the federal government began to play a very explicit role in the funding of and the creation of basic research. There was, after World War II, a broad sense that science and technology had been a key to winning World War II. Uh, Vannevar Bush, who was an advisor, a science advisor to Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, was, became quite prominent for writing Science, the Endless Frontier. He proposed the creation of actually a Department of Science, which would parallel the Department of Defense and Department of State. He didn't quite achieve that goal, but out of his work emerged the National Science Foundation, which in the United States is a major funder for university research and all kinds of really basic research, including work on education. You're all familiar with the Manhattan Project, which gave rise to a number of national laboratories focused on nuclear weapons. They continue to do all kinds of basic research. As an example, I was recently at Oak Ridge National Laboratory where they are 
convinced that they have developed three new artificial elements. So they continue to do path-breaking kind of research. And in fact, altogether, there are some 300 and, oops, I got ahead of myself, some 320 uh, laboratories, uh, uh, national laboratories that cover everything from climate change to crop research to safety, the kind of thing that we discussed at our most recent uh, conference with the counselor's office. The life sciences had a different history. They really grew out of public health institutions here and now have become the national institutes and emphasis on the S because there are a host of institutes that cover particular uh, diseases, heart, lung, diabetes, mental health, so forth and so on. Again, there was another challenge that helped shape American uh, innovation, and that was the Sputnik. That was very much my era. So people my age tended to study Russian rather than Mandarin. I think today young people are often uh, focused on Mandarin instead. There were enormous number of changes, uh, some really quite path-breaking, although they seem routine today. Uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics became NASA, the space agency. They formed what was then called the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's now the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, which was the source of a whole host of everyday innovations that have transformed our life, ranging from the internet to the global positioning system to advanced semiconductors. We also, for the first time, took a major step toward the federal government funding postgraduate education. That hadn't happened up until Sputnik. And the National Defense Education Act was adopted. Uh, there are a number of people. I'm an economist. I know it's a very one of the two most reviled professions in Washington. But at that time, the National Defense Education Act helped send a number of us to graduate school. It included a National Defense Foreign Language Fellowship Program, and there were a group of key languages that were picked out so that you would study science, you would study physics, and a foreign language at the same time. The Defense Department played a major role in advancing innovations. They are often viewed as the first critical customer. Uh, semiconductors are a prime example. Uh, Gordon Moore, who is famous for Moore's Law about how rapidly the capacity of semiconductors could advance, has been quoted as saying, but for DOD being that first customer, we might not really have as advanced as we did. The next challenge came from the rise of Japan. Japan challenged not only America's industrial leadership, but America's approach to industrial leadership. And you saw a movement from textile, shoes, consumer electronics, to steel, autos, machine tools, and semiconductors. It was an era when the US was first to invent and Japan was first to market. In the 1980s, there were a series of steps taken here. This was really the era in which there was a much more self-conscious effort to help build an innovation system. And many of the efforts were focused on bringing universities or laboratories much closer to business, much closer to the market. Uh, you may be familiar with the Bayh-Dole Act, Stevenson-Widler, a small business innovation and research program cooperative research and development agreements between companies and the national laboratories. Uh, at the Commerce Department, they uh, adopted the uh, Advanced Technology Program, which was a partnership with business focused on high-risk, high-payoff uh, innovations. I see Taffy Kingscott from IBM has just joined us. She was a strong advocate and defender of that program. Uh, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which has grown into a a, uh, an institution that has a, an advisory group for small manufacturers that's meant to be within two hours of any small manufacturer in the country. This really was modeled to some extent on what we had done in agriculture over the years. To some extent it was modeled on what Germany does and to some extent on what Japan does. Well, 
the universities in America continue to play a really key role in, universe, in, in innovation, particularly what we call the tier one universities that do a great deal of scientific engineering and so forth research. There are about 50 or 51 of those universities in the United States, and many of them are really ranked as top universities in the world. They receive the bulk of federal uh, spending on physical and life sciences research. Uh, the uh, universities have become, particularly the state universities, the Mich University of Michigan, the University of California, Berkeley, and so forth, are very much part of every governor's state development strategy. Uh, the universities, starting in the 1980s, focus more and more about the how to transfer their technology, their innovations, to business. And the question of technology transfer and how it works continues to be a, a work in progress in the United States. Some of the universities establish what we call incubators, where a professor with a brilliant idea could get kind of uh, legal and institutional support that would help him bring his idea to market. The private sector, remains very important in the United States. It accounts for about two-thirds of overall research uh, spending. Uh, as I said, since the rise of competition, that focus has been on applied research and even more on development. They do work with universities. They do work with national laboratories. And at times, that really will speed the process of turning ideas into real innovations, a movement, what you might say, from the laboratory to the living room. The, uh, there's an increasing focus here on what is called innovation clusters. Uh, Michael Porter from Harvard Business School has been a pioneer in this effort, and the focus has really been on how clusters have a lot of what we call spillovers, that is, companies will do something that benefit another company, and when you have a cluster, they tend to share in those uh, benefits. Individual states often compete to attract laboratories, to attract businesses, much as countries do around the world. The difference, of course, is the states are smaller than many countries, and so far there has not been a national or federal effort to explicitly attract businesses in a, a really in a major way. The, uh, the financing uh, of innovation, again, federal research, federal research dollars are critical for basic research. Uh, some universities use their endowments to support research, and state governments at times support research. But the bulk of that basic research comes out of federal appropriations. In applied research and development, the federal government is still active, but industry is very active. In terms of startups, one of the things that is important to understand about the American system is that while there is federal support, that small business innovation program I mentioned, and there's a lot of attention paid to venture capital, but much of the funding from actual startups comes from savings, from friends. If I had a brilliant idea, I'd probably turn to Stape and get him to invest in my uh, company. <laughs> I would uh, look at other parts of my family, credit cards, home equity loans. So there's this whole array of informal financing mechanisms that often get the idea started in the proverbial garage. I might just say a brief word about American culture, which I think does favor entrepreneurship, that there's a sense that risk-taking here is a good thing, <laughs> it's respected. In many cases, failure is viewed as the unwillingness to try again, as opposed to starting and failing. It starts when you're very young. If any of you were to drive through an American neighborhood during the summer, you will see all kinds of children with lemonade stands. Parents are very proud of them. Neighbors come over and say, John or Joan, you're going to be a great business success. So this is really woven into the culture itself. Well, the, the system today is uh, strong, I would say, but challenged. Uh, federal funding has remained relatively uh, robust, particularly for the life sciences. 
more recently, there's been an effort to close the gap with the physical sciences. The Department of Defense and NASA remain important as sources of innovation and innovation funding. Uh, certainly companies are active here. There's a major role for the universities. And in fact, increasingly people are aware that the entire educational system, really some would say from the cradle till beyond what we used to think of as retirement, is a critical piece of the innovation system. As I said, there are state strategies, but as yet there is no national overall innovation strategy. The Obama administration has taken steps toward a strategy. Uh, there were two America Competes Act that grew out of a study that you may have all read, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, a product of the Augustine Committee. Uh, it emphasized investing in physical science and supported STEM education. Obama's stimulus plan funded what had been an authorization, that is an approval to spend money, but no money had as yet been involved. Uh, there's been a good deal of investment in alternative energies as a sense that the United States, I think, like China, needs to be an all of the above kind of country and particularly moving into alternative energies. There's more recently serious investment in advanced manufacturing. And um, the National Network for Manufacturing and Innovation, you can see, is, is something that is an innovation here. To some extent, it's modeled off the, the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany, which work closely with business, provide actual research on applied problems. They are the source of many of the patents, actually, in the German system. And the Department of Education has been active here in what is called the race to the top with an emphasis on K-12 education. Well, the, uh, there are no question that there are some real clusters of future challenges that face all of us, including the American system. But right now, there's a great pressure to reduce federal spending. That could affect the support for basic science and a whole host of institutions that support innovation. Looking forward, the baby boom generation, I wouldn't want to admit that I am part of that generation, but uh, some of us uh, will be retiring and will be using the safety net that exists here. That's going to put pressure on federal spending. Increasingly, there's a competition for global talent that 20 years ago, often if people came from around the world, they really wanted to stay here. Now increasingly, there's opportunities in Europe, in China, in India, and other countries have realized how much the United States has gained from immigrant talent and are now explicitly competing. What brought this home to me was a story I heard about a French laboratory. You know how proud the French are of their own language. A French laboratory that changed its language to English so it could compete for Chinese and Indian talent. We have here a mixed quality of K through 12 education, some very good schools, some terrible schools. And increasingly, countries are looking at the strengths of American innovation and trying to adopt and adapt them to their own institutional setting. Another cluster of challenges that face all of us is that science really has gone global. Increasingly, technology development goes global. We have the emergence of truly global companies. They may be historically German or Australian or American, but increasingly they look at the world as, in English, we'd say their oyster, an opportunity that draws them wherever that opportunity happens to be. Increasingly, at least in the United States, our top universities are also going global, establishing campuses around the world. Uh, the next step is that everyone will be able to take advantage of online education. Uh, you may have read that MIT and Harvard have a partnership. A professor at Stanford has opened up courses so that if you are interested in robotics or bioengineering, often wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to acquire those skills. And at least for the United States over the last several years, there had been quite an erosion of the industrial base here. And many people, including myself, 
think that manufacturing is a critical part of the whole innovation chain. I would say that for the United States in particular, our future challenges include developing a national economic strategy, based a strategy that needs to be based on pragmatic partnerships, We need to develop a, a geoeconomic strategy that complements our geopolitical emphasis. We need to adopt the practice of benchmarking or learning from the best. I think this is something that we started to learn in the 1980s as the Toyota lean production technique seemed just a better way to do things. And so we need to be learning from China, from Germany, from Canada, wherever there happens to be a better idea and adopting or adapting it here. As a culture, we need to celebrate the great thinkers, the inventors, and the entrepreneurs, something that in the past we have not done nearly enough of. I think all of us who have that view were heartened by the attention that Steve Jobs received during the course of, of his life. And finally, I think, and this is where we'll talk, I know, about this later in the day, there are a whole series of challenges that are totally global in nature. I see Joanne Lewis there who does a lot of work on U.S.-China cooperation. I think we have a shared interest in food security, in energy security, in climate change, a host of areas in which they really are global problems. And if we can put our best minds together to attack those problems, it will surely be a much better world. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'll take it after the presentations. Um, the um, uh, Minister Liu. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I will be talking about innovation in science and technology in China. Do you hear the interpretation? Recently, I was reading some books about religion. After reading those books about religion, I decided that any religion, if it wants to exist for a long time, needs to have four factors. First of all, they have to have sort of what they call a truth. They need a mechanism, and they need a base, and they also need to have a team of followers, like Christianity. Christianity has the Bible, and they pray, they go to church, and their team is all of the missionaries that go out and preach. In Islam, I think they have what they need as well. If they can continue to develop in such a way, then the mechanisms will be working. And in innovation as well, I think for innovation, let's take those four factors and tie them together with innovation and see if we can do help to our situation in China. And that's what I'm going to focus on today in my speech. So today, In science and technology, in the past 30 years, we have achieved a lot in innovation. We've made a lot of progress. We have the second most number of, the second most uh, R&D researchers in the world, only second to the United States. China's ability to innovate is still only 21st, even though we have so many people. We're medium, not so good or not so bad, in other words. So our ability to innovate has a lot of leeway. We really need room to, imp we have room to improve. So let's get into our topic, talking about the four issues according to the four mechanisms. The first issue is our pursuit of our objective or our truth. That is our goal. How are we going to do this in the midterm and the long term? In 2006, we 
uh, promulgated a guideline for SNT innovation. In that guideline, we say very clearly that China is going to take the path of innovation. And in this guideline, we see some basic orientations or goals. The first is indigenous innovation. Secondly, cross uh, areas. And uh, the fourth is to support development. And the fourth is to lead into the future. That is a very clear goal for our innovation. And there are two key points in this guideline. First, uh, indigenous innovation. When talking about, about indigenous innovation, it usually gets very controversial because of the uh, issue of translation, there is really no the exact correspondence to the word uh, in Chinese. Uh, some say it should be independent innovation. Some say it should be homegrown innovation. It's not really to the point either. Uh, the way we understand it in Chinese is that is something that can help us uh, enhance our competitiveness. And it includes three types. First, original innovation. Second, integrated innovation. And thirdly, the introduction, digestion, and the processing. And then, re-innovation. This is what we mean by indigenous innovation, or zhuangxing in Chinese. And the second key in this guideline is that uh, the innovation in China has to be led by the business or companies. We know that since 1949, uh, China has been copying uh, the Soviet Union in terms of our economic development that is designed by the central government and uh, executed by the business. And uh, enterprises or companies are not were not considered as the uh, body of innovation, but now we're going to shift our innovation to the business sector. This is clearly laid out in the guideline. First, indigenous innovation, and secondly, uh, centered around uh, the business sector. The next uh, component is our mechanism. First, on the national level, and the second, on um, the business or the individual level. Let's start with the national level. On the national level, we have the medium and long-term scientific and technological development guideline or outline. And in 2011, we introduced the outline for the 12th five-year plan. In these uh, documents. The key point is to raise our national competitiveness. So what is our national competitiveness? It should be reflected in three parts. First, the support for uh, basic research of a country, of the government. And secondly, our educational system. How the educational system can really nurture our talents and our people, and thirdly, uh, SNT infrastructure. So these three factors determine the national competitiveness of a country. So these three are also our goals. So on these slides, I talk about the things, the specific work that we have been uh, doing. This is uh, a few goals of. Uh, in the 12th five-year uh, plan. I'm not going to go into details here. And now the incentives. What are the incentives provided by the government to uh, companies as well as individuals? We have seen some breakthrough in this area. For businesses, we use taxation policy to uh, incentivize their innovation. What do I mean th um, by this? Any high tech companies, after they uh, invest in R&D, they can use 150% uh, of their investment as deductibles in their uh, tax. So we have that number, 150%, as an incentive that encourages many companies to innovate and uh, carry out R&D. And secondly, also, from the policy point of view, we have the so-called post-subsidy. 
as long as the discovery of this R&D is good for the society or good for the development of other companies, the, poli uh, the policy is that we will provide them with post subsidies to subsidize the investment they made in the preliminary stages of their R&D. And the third mechanism is whether it is for a company or an individual, if they work together in R&D with uh, programs or projects, they can apply for either local or central government subsidies. If they have a joint uh, program, they can apply for this uh, subsidy with us. Now the third part of our presentation, the base or the platform for an innovative country or innovative nation, where does this innovation come from? In China, there are five categories. The first, national high-tech industrial zones. Since the 1980s, we have been uh, building these uh, zones, and we now have 88 of them. These zones are the core of industrial innovation as well as the core of foreign trade. This is also attracting a lot of FDI and a lot of foreign management to China. After uh, decades of uh, efforts, now in China, we see that the national high-tech uh, industrial zones bring about 30% of our uh, R&D, which means these uh, development zones are indeed very effective. I'm not going to go into details here. There are pictures here for you to see. And the second mechanism is national agricultural SNT parks. We have 1.3 billion people in China. We have to look at the food supply issue by improving our agricultural SNT. And one of the ways is to use these SNT parks to provide solutions up until now. We have hundreds of these agricultural SNT parks. This is a bit different from other parks or other zones. There is a core center in this park and also a demonstration uh, part of this park. So uh, with the park being established, the areas around it can be improved in terms of its SNT development. And the third. Uh, mechanism is national key laboratories and national research centers. We now have around 500 national labs. They research on different topics and different areas. Now, each of them have uh, been able to secure uh, enough funding for themselves. And these researchers can decide what they want to research on based on their interests. In addition to uh, national labs in our universities, we have around 100 of these national ca uh, labs uh, established in businesses or companies that help these companies or the private sector do their research that will be good for the whole society. So these business uh, national labs are also supported by the government. And another category is our industrial S&T research centers. This kind of center focuses on technological transfer as well as industrialization or commercialization. And the fourth category is the so-called Industrial Technological Innovation Strategic Alliance. Many businesses or companies, they do very similar research. In the past, they would probably compete with each other, but now they can uh, join this so-called Innovation uh, Strategic Alliance and do research together, do planning together. This strategic alliance is very effective now. On the national level, as well as the local level, these uh, strategic alliances support the collaboration between companies and help them uh, develop together. And the result is that uh, companies can gather or pool their power together. 
the innovation strategic alliances have been in place for years, and it's growing really fast right now. We now have the fifth category, which is the intermediary service institutes. For example, we have production centers, we have business incubators, we have demonstration institutes, for uh, etc. So these five categories are the mechanisms for China's innovation. Now on to the fourth part of, our, of my presentation, our people, our team. We need to develop our talents. So in terms of innovation, we have many uh, plans and designs to uh, develop our people. We have uh, different uh, programs such as um, the program for introduction and training for talents based on high uh, objective. We have program for millions of talents and Changjiang scholars. These pro projects will not only help us uh, train our people but also enhance our international cooperation, meaning our people can go abroad and uh, do their research abroad as well. This is very good for our uh, development. Nowadays, what we're doing is that in order to train more people, we now focus on the training method, the innovation of the training method. What kind of tools can we use to improve the skills of our people? What kind of ex experience can we promote? so that we can have more uh, talented researchers who can stand on the shoulders of the giant at the very beginning of their research and help our people uh, repeat the mistakes that have been made in the past and speed up uh, their research. We call this the reform of our innovative soft power, but it also includes the way we manage our people, the whole system. That is the fourth part of our of my presentation. Now on to the fifth part, the challenges and the prospect. The first 30 years since 49 to after the Cultural Revolution, our system has been uh, very planned. Everything was planned. And the second stage was between 78 to 2010, we focus on the market and foreign trade. And now the third stage, we have to focus on innovation and capital. This will be the basic development uh, direction of China. There are a few focuses that we have to look at. First, uh, technology and finance. Without the financial support, it is very difficult to innovate. For example, Silicon Valley was able to develop, develop because it had the funding that it needed. So it is a leverage or an important driving force for innovation. Now China is at a critical structure. We are faced with a lot of international competition. So we have not been able to really uh, do well at, on this front. But we have the basic understanding. When we talk about innovation, it's different from what it meant in the past. Now it means the whole process of being able to discover to being able to commercialize. So it includes R&D, the application of basic research, uh, it, all the way to promotion or commercialization. So industry plays a very important role in this whole process as well. This is an industrial chain. And we also have the market. We need to have products. We need to have services that enter the market. That's also a chain. So when we talk about innovation, we have to combine these different chains, the market chain, the innovation lane, the industrial lane, uh, line, uh, put them together. So our understanding now is that in the process of innovation, we shouldn't only look at just one chain or just one part. We have to look at the whole thing, including the market and the industry and innovation. 
and finance or funding plays a very important role in all these chains. And it is helpful to all parts, all chains in this area. Technological innovation is supported by finance, but sometimes they are not really in harmony because innovation is not always predictable. There are uncertain things in innovation. And with the development of times, it changes too, which is different in finance. Finance or financing has to minimize risks. They need predictability. They want facilitation, uh, particularly they need predictabil uh, predictability. So these two uh, might not uh, fit each other very well. So our challenge is to fit the two together. In the process of innovation, we need to deal with the problem of commercialization and uh, raise the predictability of uh, innovation. Government and the integration of resources play a very important role in all this. And secondly, on IPR and innovation, how do we protect IPR without hindering new innovation? That is the next challenge we face. That is, the regime of IPR should be uh, helpful to our technological innovation. So in one of our government uh, documents, we say that IPR protection has to speed up our innovation. And at the same time, through the protection of IPR, we should help these researchers and R&D uh, companies get the benefits that they are entitled to. So we have promulgated a series of guidelines and ca catalogs on IPRs talking about what should be done in the area of IPR protection. Uh, protection. We also talk about uh, training of the protection of IPR. We have done a lot in this area. So in a word, the promotion of IPR protection is to help our country innovate, innovate, uh, innovate even more. We do still have some problems in this area. The promotion of IPR or the use of IPR is not as long as that in the US. So we have uh, laid out many uh, guidelines and uh, concrete measures to do this work. Lastly, the reform of our system. Just last month, on our national level, we decided to uh, look even further into the question of reform of our technological system. We have to change the system or reform the system to encourage even more innovation and speed up innovation in China. So now when we talk about the reform of this SNT uh, system, we will now be carrying out a new round of technology conferences in China where we will talk about this reform. Let me see. Right. We need to solve three problems. First, the mismatch between science and technology and the economy, because some people think that these are two different things. That is, how do we combine s and and the whole economy? How do we go from just research to commercialization? Through, in this process, uh, we don't have uh, a mechanism in place all the time, so we need to solve that problem. And secondly, the existence the coexistence of excessive management and scattered, efficient, and repeated problem. In the recent years, our innovation has been speeding up. In the past, we wasted a lot of money. Now we have more financial resources. We have to avoid 
uh, repeated work and avoid the waste of our resources. That calls for better management of our resources. And our third issue is to solve the unreasonable evaluation mechanism for scientific research. For example, how do we uh, evaluate a certain researcher and its value? And the whole system of evaluation also needs to be reformed to overall, in, in an overall way, reform our innovation in China. OK, as a summary, as a conclusion, I would like to say three things. First of all, the ability to innovate in science and technology decides a country's ability to compete. And the other thing I would like to say is just bringing in technology doesn't mean that you can innovate. Real innovation cannot be bought. Real capacity to innovate cannot be bought. So we have to do it our own. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Though there's a lot of material in the uh, presentations, and we now have some time for uh, questions and answers. I would like to begin with a question to um, uh, Minister Liu. Uh, you referred to the importance <coughs> of enterprises in the uh, innovation process. But you didn't distinguish between state-owned enterprises and private enterprises. What is the balance between the innovation produced by the state-owned enterprises and the innovation produced by the private sector? Could you comment yeah. on that? State enterprises and private enterprises are both there, but Right now, they're, they're pretty much the same. They're both encouraging innovation, and they're both working. Right now, SOEs have more capital. They're more able. They have more capacity. And so they are a strong arm in the process. But to China, we have 4 million enterprises, 4 million companies, and more of them are private than public. 90% of the total number of companies are private. and. They are providing 80% of the employment opportunities in our country currently. And as for taxes also, um, they are providing 70% of tax revenue. The thing is, with the smaller private companies, they are not innovative enough, and that should be worked on. But from the point of view of public finance, and support for these private companies. It can't come directly from the government. That wouldn't be fair, because then they'd be providing support to you or him and not her or him. And that wouldn't be impartial. So right now, the situation is that there are some alliances, industry alliances. A lot of them get together, and they work on technologies which can be used in different companies or different industries. And that process is supported by the country. Tax-wise, also, we support private companies spend more money, spending more money on their R&D, on their innovation. And what we're doing is having a 150 percent tax deduction for, for everything they put into for R&D. They can count it 1.5 times in their deduction. So for state enterprises, they're stronger, they're bigger. However, I think in the future, the main innovators in the process of innovation will be private companies more and more so in the future. The floor is open. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question to Minister Liu, and I thank him for his presentation, which is quite uh, dialectical and informative. Um, my question is uh, about post-subsidy, uh, which was rather new to me, because uh, I've heard of angel funds, which is in, uh, essentially investing into a risk. But if you invest into a success, that is to say, if this R&D has already proven to be marketable, 
and you still put government money into this, it sounds like a protectionist policy. And probably I'm wrong, so please correct me. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, okay, I'll answer you. This type of post-subsidy policy started way back with crops. It was post-subsidies for different varieties of crops. If there was breeding and they succeeded in breeding a new variety, they wanted to um, popularize it among the society, but for the people who invented those new varieties of crops, they were subsidized. The reason for that was because they were encouraging breeding new varieties, and then at the same time, time, we wanted to have new strategic industries like new energy or other types of industries that were considered new strategic energies that were moving in new directions. They were given post-subsidies. And so especially new energy, that's a real big one for that, like wind power, solar power. For those areas, for research and development, if they succeed and then it becomes a product and it gets uh, popularized in the whole society, they will be post-subsidized. Also, there are other measures. There are other measures to encourage uh, companies in, for instance, the hybrid vehicle area the hybrid vehicle field. For instance, for individuals, for coal, oh, oh sorry, for, for a new energy vehicle, um, then if you buy it, then you get 50,000 RMB as a subsidy. And then they might feel like that is a cheaper than buying another kind of car. That is another type of post-subsidy. To researchers, whether it's a new strate strategic uh, enterprise or new strategic direction of any kind, whatever kind, we are encouraging them because there will be risk or they did have risk at one time and otherwise it might be hard for them to incur that risk. After putting in the money, what happens is they're opposed subsidized, but sometimes they're actually subsidized uh, in the earlier stages. When we talk about post subsidies, it's not a hundred percent subsidy, but it's part subsidy. That's our post subsidy policy. I, I can't. I can't hear. I have a question for Mr. Hughes. We have taken note of the fact that in scientific and technological innovation right now, the market is very important. Tying the market to the innovators and having that close relationship is so important, Mr. Hughes. So I want to know if you can talk about that in emissions reductions and new energy. Do you have any market mechanisms to try to tie those technologies closer to the market? Thank you. Thank you, and really an excellent question. Uh, compared to, I would say, Japan, China, and Germany in the field of, of uh, solar power, uh, we have not taken the step of helping to create a market. That is part of what I thought uh, uh, Mr. Liu was referring to in terms of his post-subsidies. There is a, a real interest, however, in moving things as close to the market, I would say, as possible. I think here we would feel that it's appropriate for the uh, government to make sure that there's a proof of concept so that it's really very easy for the private sector to take that on. At times in the past, the government has emerged as the first consumer and in that sense created a market for the innovation. I suspect that will continue at times in the future, although the pattern here has been that the Department of Defense has played uh, a very strong role with that regard, although there's often, as you saw with the internet, extensive civilian applications. So that remains a challenge for us, as to how to think about an innovation that has enormous promise for the future, but is not yet ready to, by itself, create a market. I'd like to, uh, my name is Steve Merrill, I'm with the National Academy of Sciences, and I'd like to ask the minister to elaborate a bit on his very last point. In the United States, we have a c political culture that encourages evaluation of government initiatives. Um, and that, um, that culture, um, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's episodic, it's not always consistent. 
Um, but we tend not to take on faith that these government programs always work. Um, and, uh, and so we, we have a widely distributed responsibility um, for evaluating um, innovation initiatives uh, across universities, across government agencies, and, and private institutions such as my own, the Academy. Um, so um, one has the impression that in China, um, uh, this, this plethora of recent initiatives to stimulate innovation um, is uh, um, not necessarily carefully evaluated. And I was curious that you referred to the need to strengthen and uh, reform the evaluation process at the end of your remarks, and I'd like to know a little bit more about what that might entail and particularly whose responsibility across government, across private institution um, evaluation is. For the innovation, uh, there are several players. You know, one is government, second we said the uh, company, and uh, the third one m must be the society. And uh, this can be uh, uh, moved into one combination to, to work together. And uh, in China, we try to uh, stimulate the innovation and try to in, in different ways and the different kind of uh, approaches. But uh, anyhow, and, uh, we have no uh, existing experience in accordance with Chinese situation. We just uh, try and again and try and try. And uh, we have a lot of failures, of course. But uh, and, uh, we can learn from those failures and uh, to, to improve a little bit uh, uh, step by step. This is our, our uh, concept or, or intent. Maybe, and uh, we did some, and uh, we feel that uh, as long as uh, it works, and we will continue. But uh, w uh, once we, we feel uh, it's not fit to the Chinese situation, and uh, we are going to change. Yes, and uh, we, we uh, I just uh, want to mention, we have not yet enough experience to improve the innovation in China. But uh, we have uh, the feeling to try to improve uh, step by step. Yes. Uh, Eugene Huang with the Brookings Institution. Um, Dr. Hughes and Vice Minister Liu, this question is directed at the both of you. Um, there's a widely held uh, perception in the United States that when it comes to technological innovation, uh, the U.S. takes a more hands-off approach where the government has more of a limited role, and uh, in China there is a more hands-on approach from the government. Um, and I think the presentations of both of you demonstrate that the truth is somewhere in between. Um, but I'd love to hear the reaction from the both of you on two parts. One, uh, what is the appropriate balance in your opinion between government in, uh, uh, action and what the private sector um, is supposed to do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, innovation. And secondly, um, in assessing that balance, how do you know you have succeeded? Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to ask this first. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, in my point of view, for the basic research, fundamental research, and uh, the government uh, should uh, take uh, much more share, maybe n more than 90% of the total cost. But uh, for, for, for the marketing technology, and maybe the, the, the companies, enterprises, should it take a more share, maybe no more than 90%. But uh, uh, it, it is difficult to, 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 
to balance and uh, in between of the basic and the market. And uh, this needs the, the concrete or uh, careful negotiation or uh, assessment between government and the company. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, government pay more, sometimes the, 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 the company pay more. But uh, uh, in, in the Chinese situation, nowadays the overall innovation or, or uh, uh, innovation is towards economy. That's why nowadays about uh, seventy percent of the uh, about the R and D this uh, come from the, the company right now in China. Thank you, Eugene. That's a, an excellent question. I think in the U.S. in practice this has varied by sector. Um, uh, Minister Liu mentioned the agricultural emphasis in China. And really, some people would say that America's most successful industrial policy has been in the field of agriculture, where the government funds a good deal of research. We have an active extension service that helps take that uh, innovation, the best practices and crop management and so forth, to the individual farmer and many of our top tier one agricultural land grant colleges educate the farmers. We have a whole system in which you're innovating, spreading the innovation, and educating the, the farmer to make the most use of that. And in fact, it's become very sophisticated with satellites and GPS guiding what crops ought to be planted in what area. Uh, in other instances, uh, the Department of Defense, being both a funder of research and the prime customer, has really been a very influential, very influential factor in stimulating innovations that have served not only national security but often eventually had a big impact in the civilian sector. The big difference here is that been a great deal of debate over what the government should or should not do in the fields of energy and the fields of the economy more broadly. Uh, and I think the challenges here are partly a uh, a misunderstanding of America's past in which the government has played a more active role and also a, a sense uh, or perhaps a neglect of looking at how competitive the world has become. Minister Liu referred to growing competition uh, in the world. I mean, China is a major competitor. India certainly is increasingly a major competitor. There are aspects of the Brazilian system which uh, is very competitive. We recently hosted a group of members of Congress from Brazil here th at the Wilson Center. Their entire focus was on innovation. What could they learn from us? What could, how could they improve the innovation system in Brazil? So I think, uh, Steve, you, there is a, uh, maybe a three-part answer to your question. Number one, of course, the question is of uh, national priorities. Number two, it's a question of global competition. Uh, if country X is pursuing a very aggressive policy with heavy subsidies, then the country Y has to decide if being in a particular industry is also a national priority, and if so, they need to meet the competition. And finally, to be willing to be uh, sectorally flexible, that some sectors will require a greater degree of uh, government involvement and others uh, will not. So I think that kind of new thinking, new flexibility, and a pragmatic approach to global competition. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Hello, Minister Liu. I am from an uh, international TV and radio station in China. In your speech just now, you were talking a lot about scientific and technological innovation and how it ties together with financing. What I'd like to ask you here is about the government policies and how much you are open to American and other countries' capital, foreign capital, and where, whether or not there's room for working together the uh, American enterprise's willingness uh, to uh, get access to the uh, Chinese capital market for the uh, technology uh, innovation. Thank you. Uh, uh, 
in China, we don't have any barriers in terms of FDI coming into China to support our innovation. I talked about our high-tech zones. In those high-tech zones, we have many, many foreign companies working there or providing funding there. So in these high-tech zones, we also have incubators, we have financial institutions, and we have uh, venture capitals as well. These are completely open to FDI or foreign investment. We have no barriers. And uh, the financial sector is also opening up as well. We have many foreign banks who are now operating in China. They provide loans to SMEs in China. As far as I understand, we don't have any barriers. It's, we welcome foreign investment. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's quite true. That there's extensive American investment. I think the question here is that in some cases it appears that for a company to participate in the Chinese market, they're strongly encouraged to share their technology, which is a, a practice at variance with the American approach. So we need to think about how to put these two somewhat different systems together. Marco? Marco Di Capo, I'm the former science counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. I actually worked under Tape Roy, who was the best boss I ever had. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> He's not that way at the Wilson Center. He's very <laughs> tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question that I have is, as uh, China engages more and more in innovation in large infrastructure projects, and I'm thinking, for example, high-speed trains, <coughs> electrical grids, uh, large construction projects for hydropower both in China and abroad, is what steps is the Chinese government and the industry is taking actually to manage a risk and to actually establish the bodies where you can have a participatory regime in managing risk for these large projects? Yeah, that's a very tough question. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, Chinese just want, uh, would like to have the high speed, high growth. That's the, the, the basic intention. But uh, after those uh, movements, and uh, many accidents happened, uh, especially for the uh, uh, hi highway or high speed train. Now the government realized uh, this risk cannot uh, continue our growth. And, uh, and we start to have a more budget on the risk assessment. Just like uh, last year, we have the discussion and uh, uh, we with our American friends talk about uh, the, the risk. Nowadays, and uh, uh, like the high speed train, and uh, nowadays all the speeds slow down. And uh, we realized if we do not do so, the risk uh, will happen sooner or later. And uh, in the other field, we also realized uh, a, a bit uh, about this. And, uh, and uh, nowadays, and, uh, the new project of Chinese uh, uh, R&D, and uh, eight, uh, one a term, that's the risk assessment. And, uh, that's uh, where we learned from our failure. And uh, we know risk uh, assessment should be very, very important in the process of growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doug? Uh, I'm Doug Spellman. I'm the deputy director of the Kissinger Institute. Following on uh, Minister Liu's comments about our last symposium, which had to do with risk, here are the results. And there are, we have limited copies, unfortunately, but there are some out on the table. So a small advertisement, if you'd like to read more about this, this is in Chinese and in English. Thanks. <laughs> it raises the question of the role of advertising in uh, spreading <laughs> innovation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Just in the rear. Hi, I'm uh, Jimmy Goodrich with the Information Technology Industry Council. Oops. Just had a question for Vice Minister Liu. I saw it's interesting you're talking about uh, reform in the S and T system, and this is obviously a very big topic right now, and lots of people are focused on this. And I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned there was a coexistence of excessive administration and lots of perhaps many different uh, government bodies looking at this issue. In your role as the uh, counselor to the state council, I'm wondering what you would recommend um, for how to perhaps remedy that problem of excessive government um, administration and scatter inefficiency, which, will you, which you raise as a very interesting problem. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Because I'm not uh, in the position of the government right now, mm -hmm. uh, I cannot uh, I cannot say directly and what they are going to do. But uh, in my own understanding, and uh, the government should uh, clearly identify the government role in the R and D, and uh, they use the the, the public money, and uh, should do more on the public uh, sectors. Uh, to to benefit to cover uh, more people to be bene to 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 to, uh, to to have the benefit so the government uh, used the one kind of uh, the, 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 the the budget and uh, the companies and uh, they are play a role in the competition in the in the world competition they, the, the, these two role really have certain kind of conflict but uh, uh, the government role is to uh, to create the environment. This is the most important to uh, to provide more uh, funding for the basic research, fundamental research, and uh, to 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 create to, to improve the new kind of technology and to share the risk before uh, into the market. Th that's my own understanding. Hello, uh, Patrick Fisher from NASA. Uh, question, or question for Minister Liu. Uh, you mentioned, in, you highlighted in your presentation the importance of market competition and uh, encouraging these market mechanisms to promote innovation. Uh, how does China intend to promote innovation in segments of the economy that are closed to global competition, um, especially con some of these state owned not too very cash. Sorry? Mm. Could you? Uh, Use the microphone a little closer, oh, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question is, uh, you highlighted the importance of market competition to promote innovation. Um, my question is, in segments of the economy that are closed to global competition, um, certain state-owned enterprises, certain entire sectors, how does China intend to promote innovation um, in, in these segments that uh, where competition uh, doesn't uh, exist as fully as in other yeah, You mean the government's role? Uh, yeah, well, the, the government's role or the, the companies in these segments, how do they, how do they get better um, when they have, they're not open to competitors, uh, foreign competitors in some cases, that would, uh, that would uh, mm -hmm. compel them to mm -hmm. improve and to innovate? Uh, I think competition exists uh, everywhere. That's the, uh, the, the function for the companies. The government uh, should not uh, directly involved uh, in the competition itself. But uh, the government can play a role uh, to improve the condition, the environment for to, to the companies. And uh, maybe for the capacity building and uh, uh, for improve the innovation itself. But uh, uh, I think the government should not uh, directly involved in the competition. Uh, 
Uh, no, uh, sorry, I did not very. My English is bad. Uh, on this question, these uh, sectors are concerned with national security. So these technologies, from what I see now, is uh, supported by the government, by government funding. So on this issue or this question, it's similar to basic research. It's still major, uh, uh, it's still supported by the government. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Ira Kassoff from APCO Worldwide. Um, I wanted to ask a question about Zizhu um, Chuangxin, which um, actually in, in the US I think was most commonly translated as indigenous innovation. Um, but one of the policies that the Chinese government was pursuing was developing a number of catalogs of products that achieved this status. Uh, and there was a lot of criticism of that, that the Chinese uh -huh. government was picking winners and losers. And I'm wondering what the thinking is now about that, uh, that policy. Well, the word has been in debate for five years now. <laughs> and now we don't even have a conclusion. We don't have a standard explanation of the word some say independent innovation, some say homegrown, some say indigenous innovation, none of which really fits the Chinese phrase. Some say initiative innov uh, innovation now. Well, even that doesn't really explain what the phrase means. So some people suggest that we don't use the word zizhu, just use xin, just use innovation. It's clear enough. So we're, we're still thinking about this. Because now we have this phrase in Chinese, but no one understands it in other countries. That really brings confusion. So we're, we're trying to avoid using that word now. We're just using innovation. We think that's enough. Just a quick uh, follow-up. My, my question really is the second part of what I said, which is, producing these product catalogs, products that meet this Zizhu Chuangxin status. Um, that raised many problems. How does the government decide which products achieve this? Because then the idea was that local governments and central government would be encouraged to procure products that are on that list. So that created a lot of controversy. First of all, it was hard for foreign companies' products to be on the list. Secondly, the Chinese government somehow was choosing which products would be favored and which products would not be favored. So my question is, what's the current thinking about that approach? Well, on this question, it, it really garners a lot of attention. According to the WTO rules, we should treat everybody the same. We don't have, we, don't, we shouldn't have any uh, difference. So it's also a problem after we have this uh, new word, this new phrase. People now notice this, and uh, something that we should follow the international rules. Uh, for uh, Dr. Hughes, you mentioned uh, briefly in passing uh, Vannevar Bush's interest in the Department of Science, and we've had that debate in this country on and off over the years. I wonder if you would share with us your own thinking about the desirability of having a Department of Science. Would we have been better off in the course of the last 30 or 40 years without one, or with one, rather than without one? Uh, I asked the question, obviously, in the context of, of China, which has a Ministry of Science and Technology. So I kind of wonder whether this whole issue of a Department of Science sheds light at all on the strength of national innovation systems uh, and the role of government, going back to Eugene's question as well. well that's an I'm uh, Pete Sutmeyer, University of Oregon. But that's an excellent question, and periodically people have pushed for a Department of Science. It's a, an ongoing debate here. I think the 
the ways that we are likely to go, and I think that will work best for us, is first to cross the Rubicon of actually having a national growth and innovation strategy. And second, to take advantage of the National uh, Council on Science and Technology that was set up to be a coordinating body within uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, this really, uh, Alan Bromley was, took the first step in this direction that under uh, President Clinton you had this National Council established which is meant to, through its subcommittees, to take a look at cross-cutting efforts. So it may still make sense for the Department of Agriculture to focus on agricultural science, yet some of what they're doing will really affect the interests of HHS as you can grow medicine. So you need, I think, that coordinating body and even more fundamentally a national strategy. I have a question for Dr. Hughes. Uh, you referred in your remarks to the Augustine Commission uh, report. Uh, which was issued, what, in the middle of the last decade. And then they followed up five years later with a follow-up report in which they indicated that none of their recommendations had been implemented and that, in fact, we were worse off than before in terms of our global competitiveness. Uh, what, if anything, should be done about that? situation. Well, since that second report uh, where they refer to the storm as reaching Category 5, which you know is a very serious hurricane, the, uh, the stimulus bill did fund key parts of the legislation that was inspired by the rising above the gathering storm, the America Competes Act, including money for ARPA-E, that is an energy version of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Subsequent to that, there was an effort, and successfully, to have a second America Competes Act, which did pass both the House and the Senate with significant bipartisan support. Again, that approves spending, it doesn't provide spending. It authorizes spending, it doesn't actually appropriate the money. There has, since that time, I would say, been a slowdown on the meeting the goals of investing in physical science, although they're still moving toward that more ambitious goal. On the education side, there's an enormous array of innovation going on here, experiments of all kinds, none so scaled to affect our position on the international exams, where, as you know, the U.S. in the Program on International Student Assessment is 14th in reading, 17th in science, and 25th in mathematics, uh, a situation which is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in the light of, uh, in the light of uh, Dr. Hughes' uh, response to the U.S. lack of uh, uh, Department of Science, uh, I suppose in China, we have uh, Ministry of Science and Technology. I'm curious uh, about um, uh, Minister Liu's uh, view as uh, the science and technology being conducted uh, by uh, mission-oriented ministries in China. Do you have a such a mechanism? Uh, has that been changing over the last uh, few years? And if so, how do you see their relationship uh, to the vision and, and the programs uh, coordinated by, uh, m by most? Uh, as the, the government role for science, te uh, science and technology is mainly for the capacity building. And then nowadays, the Ministry of Science and Technology have uh, more and more programs on the capacity building itself. Uh, for example, the key laboratories, uh, key laboratories and uh, we have one program of a platform. <coughs> platform just to to make uh, uh, different kind of uh, institutions working together to have the one platform. The, the government uh, support those people work together. This is uh, the capacity building. And another ag ag example is about the, uh, the methodology uh, training, uh, like the ideas, the methodology, and the uh, research tools, the instruments, the construction. And, uh, and uh, previously, uh, within the Ministry of Science and Technology, and uh, spent a lot of uh, effort 
on the program sharing, uh, distribution. Now the role is, uh, is uh, shifting and uh, a little bit uh, step by step and uh, shift more on the capacity building. For the national capacity building cannot replaced by single companies. Can, uh, can so, so that, that's, uh, <coughs> for innovation, <coughs> there are several kind of things should be done. For the single technology, and uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the technology of the field, uh, one kind of field, or uh, <coughs> one group of field, and uh, for the local uh, capacity building, and the national one. And uh, there are several levels. So uh, nowadays, the Ministry of Science and Technology focuses mo on more on the basic fundamental environment. Uh, I think uh, this, uh, this kind of work uh, should be uh, last long, especially, especially for uh, uh, our country from poor uh, to, to, to grow. We have time for one final question. And uh, thank you for your presentations. I really appreciate them. And my name is Ji and uh, Mu Ge in Chinese. And I'm from Georgetown University and do, and uh, right now I enter in IAS group, which provides uh, consulting for the, uh, for foreign investors to do investment in China. Uh, I really like the idea that both of you have mentioned that um, the transformation from innovation to business is very, is very important. So as we are doing the consulting for uh, foreign investors to do business in Chinese food industry, my question is that how, uh, what kind of impact do you think will the, will, will the innovation bring to the development of Chinese food industry? And uh, I would like to ask uh, Minister Liu. foreign investors and uh, working uh, in China for innovation. Uh, maybe they have different kind of approaches to, to enter this field. And uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the Deutsche Bank and uh, directly uh, work together with the Chinese bank and to, to develop one program on uh, the uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprise uh, uh, investment. And uh, many of the companies from the, 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 the UK, and uh, they are mainly involved in uh, uh, venture capitals. And uh, they, 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 they uh, speed up uh, very fast. Uh, I'm not really realized a lot of American uh, bankers or investors and uh, work actively, uh, actively, uh, actively in, Ch in China. I did not uh, fully realize. Maybe for many of Amer American investors, they did not yet uh, fully under understand, understand Chinese background, Chinese uh, situation, or, or the, the, the Chinese policies on the, on the, on the foreign investors. And uh, maybe uh, with uh, your uh, effort, you can introduce more, and uh, you can make the bridge between the two to fill this gap. And uh, uh, wish you uh, uh, success in th this field. Uh, thank you. I, I we've reached the time for a 15-minute break. I think we can conclude from the presentations uh, that both countries attach considerable importance to innovation, even though we are approaching the question in somewhat different ways. Uh, but I have learned a lot from the presentation and from the questions and answers. We will break until 11 o'clock when we will reassemble for our second panel on U.S.-China S&T cooperation, and uh, Dr. DiCapua will be in the chair for that event.